Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming to the session. Uh, it's good to see so many people here. Uh, and, and as a vendor, it's also good to see people that are A, not my competitors, and B, not my, my staff. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we have a panel here today. We're going to talk about um, the idea of how is technology really starting to impact what you would consider to be traditional research. And, and we're going to talk about things like, uh, you know, is, uh, is content, regulatory content, for instance, is that a commodity or is, that, is there an opportunity for value add um, both through the library and through the way we present that uh, information? Um, my name is Dean Sonderegger. I am a vice president of, of what we call legal markets at Walters Kluwer. So it's pretty much things that are sold to the people in this room, research, content, uh, um, productivity solutions. Uh, I am joined today uh, by two panelists who I will let them introduce themselves, but we'll start off with Oliver. Thank you very much for, for hosting this. Um, my background is, is um, uh, has been principally uh, academic um, in the sense of, of being a, a law professor at Vermont Law School. But I'm, in the last couple of years, I've been branching out. And uh, uh, I am the, a founding director of a company called Scopus Labs, uh, which um, does uh, legal um, a, machine learning and AI-driven analytics on, on, on a variety <laughs> of different subjects, including uh, legislation. And we're lucky enough to have, have uh, Walters Kluwer as a partner on, on distributing some of that information. Um, uh, also, um, uh, I'm a, a affiliated faculty at Stanford's Codex Center for Legal Informatics, and I am putting the toe in for increasingly a, 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 a practice-related work in, in this area. So again, uh, 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 as a good Vermonter, you've got to, got to do a number, you've got to plow in the winter and uh, uh, farm in the summer, so I, I'm doing, doing a number of different things. And Russell? Yes, my name is Russell Switzer. I'm a uh, senior tax research analyst, it used to be called a tax librarian. Um, with a uh, large midtown New York law firm, uh, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Warden, and Garrison, and I've been there for about 20 years. Thank you, Russell. So I'm gonna go through uh, a couple of uh, things to start off to try and frame our conversation a little bit, um, and then we're gonna go through a set of questions with the panel back and forth, uh, and then we're gonna leave some time at the end so that if anybody wants to ask these fine gentlemen a question, uh, we'll have some time back and forth for that, probably about 20 minutes at the end. So that's kind of structurally what we're talking about here. Um, I want to introduce a framework, if you will, um, where we talk about value and a value chain for solutions. And we internally at Walters Kluwer, we call these things expert solutions to differentiate from probably a traditional content solution. So this is, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of set the framework out and then we're going to start to talk a little bit back and forth on that. And I'm going to show you two examples very quickly um, of, of uh, you know, changes that have occurred in some of our products as a result of that or, or new products. So, when we think about uh, most tasks that we're doing, either from a research standpoint, uh, an attorney is doing, um, we think about, I, I like to think about in terms of the 80-20 the, the rule, right? So it's always you know, overstated, but about 80% of the time that we spend on things are fairly repetitive. We don't really think they add value, but we, need, we know we need to do them to get to the point in time where we start to add the value. And then about 20% is the stuff that's kind of fun to do. Um, and I think that can be applied to a lot of stuff. So the question is, as we say, um, as we start to inject technology and we start to move forward in terms of uh, uh, the impact of that technology on our day-to-day -day work, how does that affect that and how do we measure that? And so the first step that we talk about here is really a move for efficiency. So I, I can use technology to automate things that I might have manually done heretofore. And when I do that, what happens is that you see that that repetitive bar actually starts to shrink down. So now maybe it's not 80% of my time, maybe it's 30% of my time that I'm doing uh, on the repetitive stuff. And that gives me more time to, to, to get insight and to pr provide value add. And so your first kind of um, rung in the ladder of the value story here is really around improved efficiency. Uh, I'm not changing the way I'm working necessarily. Uh, I'm doing the same things, but the technology has helped me automate that. And that's good, right? Uh, obviously, it's good to be able to do some stuff, particularly if uh, you, know, you can do more stuff if you're more efficient at it. Um, but I think the next level up, which is, uh, is interesting to me, is to start to talk about outcome. So now, it's interesting if I've done it quicker and I get some more time to, to think about things, can I have with the technology something that provides me some insight in a different fashion? Can I drive so that now my value add starts to grow even more and I drive outcome? Um, what's an example of that? Well, gosh, um, uh, can, I, uh, can I, for instance, if I'm 
uh, looking at, uh, and we think about analytics in the sense, if I'm looking at uh, contract analytics, can I understand prevailing terms in a way that allows me to negotiate better? Can I get my attorneys a situation where they know what opposing counsel has accepted before? So when the opposing counsel says, oh gosh, we never do that, you say, well yeah, it's interesting that you say you never do that, but in the last 12 months, five or seven times you've accepted that term, so can we stop the dance and just move on? That drives us to outcome, right? And I think that the interesting thing, if you go even a step above that, is you can say, I can be guided towards outcome for my clients, whether they be internal or external, and then if I have benchmarks on that, that's an even additional value add there. So I, not only can I say, hey, I've driven an outcome, but I can also say, and that outcome relative to other people is at a particular point. So again, if I take the contract example, um, I can be in a situation where I may or may not care to negotiate on certain terms um, because Maybe it's not really that relevant. If I look at the market standard, uh, I might be in a situation where I've ha hit that market standard, and even though I could probably push on a term, it's not worth it to me. Um, I'm going to push on other things there. So the benchmarking is an additional value add there. So we move up the value chain. Uh, and I think it's an interesting way of measuring when I have to look at what I'm going to potentially invest in or do. How does that move up the value chain? If I can get to something that's important to the firm, that moves me all the way up there and allows the attorneys to get to a point where they have better outcomes for their clients, I'm going to get better client retention, I'm going to find more clients, I'm going to be able to bill more. There's happiness and nirvana everywhere. And so I will choose those solutions every day over just the efficiency, but the outcome gets built on the efficiency and the automation. So that's a quick introduction from a framework standpoint. I'm going to very, very quickly go through a couple of examples of, well, how would one do that, or what, what's an example of technology that, that we have that does that? And then we'll shift over to the panel real quickly. So what I'm showing you right now is an example of automation. We have a product called the Standard Federal Tax Reporter. It's a periodical, many of you are probably familiar. Russell, I'm sure, is in the midst of the Standard Federal Tax Reporter on a regular basis. Yeah. And it shows uh, rules, regs, law with explanation over a period of time. So. Uh, I can look at that at any point in time and see where you are in current state. Well, oops. And I'm looking at that on the page here, but not here. So bear with me for just a second. There we go. Um, and so the interesting thing about that is that I'm not always looking at today's code. So I just have a very quick example here. If I was looking at um, limitations um, uh, per code, and, uh, and I, if you look over the top here, it's interesting. You can see that there's a timeline. And so one of the things that I have to do if I'm dealing with a dated matter or if my attorney wants to understand how law has evolved uh, over a period of time is I have to go back and look at the changes historically. Well, that's a very manual process and uh, time consuming. It really hits into that 80-20 rules that the insight that I'm looking to get out was what changed, but I have to do a lot of labor to get to that point in time. So we've built a tool that lays on top of our content set that gives us that timeline. And here you can see there's been changes um, in 2006, 2007, and 2013. And it allows me to actually redline compare what's changed over time. I can do this with commentary and annotations also on that. And the purpose of the conversation here today not being to go into a detailed demonstration. If you'd like a detailed demonstration, we're more than happy to do it down at the, uh, the booth in the exhibit hall. Um, but just to show that's an example of applying technology, and all I'm doing at that point in time is I'm just automating something that somebody would t typically have to do manually. Freeze up time, uh, and in some cases it's very hard to do manually because you may not have the archives and so on and so forth. Another example that I'd like to call out is work that we've done with Oliver here. And we have a product that we call the Federal Developments Knowledge Center. And um, so the question that we try and solve there is, there are, um, what is it, about 4% of bills that are introduced into Congress uh, actually become law. Um, and so I'm trying to talk to my client about what's going to happen in their life. Uh, yeah, what, what's going to pass through that's going to be a change that's relevant to you. And 96% of the changes are not going to happen. And then of the 4% they, that are going to happen, they go through a lot of uh, iteration as they go through. So Oliver and uh, at Scopus Labs, they did something which is remarkable where they analyzed about 15 years worth of, uh, uh, I probably have the wrong, uh, about 15 years, about 60,000 
um, uh, bills that were introduced over a period of time, and they built some analytics on that. And the analytics tell you the likelihood of the bill passing a chamber, the likelihood of a bill um, uh, becoming law as it goes through that process. And what you see up here is you see kind of a little bit of an example here is that there are a number of factors that are positive and negative factors. Here, for instance, it's the, uh, is the prevailing party Republican uh, sponsor of the bill? Is it, uh, um, is it a House bill? Um, is it, was it introduced in the previous con Congress? There's about 200 variables that they've actually pulled out of these bills. And they look at that. But the neat thing about that is not only do they look at the 200 variables to try and predict what's going to go on, they also look at the text of the bill. So there are certain terms um, in, uh, in, in a bill, and I would just, you know, without taking a, a political stance, I would say Planned Parenthood would be one of those things that if you see that, that's a very volatile uh, uh, concept in uh, the support of that is very volatile and very politically charged. So there are certain terms that make it less likely that uh, a bill is going to go through. So they have actually analytics um, that are fascinating to see that have mixed both the the text of the bill as well as the 200 variables they've pulled out to predict. And what that allows us to do then is I can say that, for instance, in this particular bill we're looking at, it's past the House, so the likelihood of that's 100 percent. And currently, that's a 50 percent chance or so of, of passing through the Senate and becoming law. That's an example of applying technology to a problem in a different way that we don't really have. I uh, spent a lot of time in my career as a tax in the tax software world, and I could talk to you about the likelihood of certain changes occurring um, uh, in the tax code uh, because I spent a lot of time doing it. But there, there were very few of us that had that particular knowledge, and you had to devote a, a firm amount of time to actually get to that point. This democratizes that, if you will, in the sense that anybody who comes in is effectively an expert on that. And where does this come in? Well, this comes in for client advisement. It comes in for a lar large number of things that get through there. So this is not meant to be comprehensive. Just two quick examples of how technology applied to a regulatory framework in a different fashion actually changes your ability to interact with that fashion. So with that as the lead-in, I am going to shift over and talk to our uh, panelists here. Um, and so with that kind of lead in there, and I'll throw it over to Oliver to start off with. And by the way, we're recording this, so that's why I'm standing in there sitting, because there's the microphone here. Um, so, so is, you know, where in your, um, in your practice, let's, let's start with, uh, I, I'll start with uh, Oliver, where in your experience in academia and your interaction with clients are you seeing opportunities for technology to start to insert itself into the research process, into the, the, the work of the attorneys? Is, is the traditional content um, still relevant, or, or does it have to be added? Have, does there have to be technology insertion to make that relevant, uh, you think, Oliver? Well, the uh, traditional knowledge is, is the starting point for a lot of this. My own, my own thought of, of, of how you sort of rank this is that there's the legal information out there. Uh, the first step is just finding it, getting it in, in your hands. Uh, that's the classic old, old-fashioned search, classic, you know, library reference librarian kind of a piece of just getting the information there. Uh, then you want to, another layer is sort of sorting and grouping, you know, figuring out and prioritizing, figuring out where you're going to put all of this uh, and which ones you actually want to pay attention to. And then there's this kind of analytics of that, of that level of kind of, well, what does it mean? What could I tell a client? And um, uh, what I think we've seen in, in, in uh, the increasing application of smarter and smarter um, uh, technologies is moving up that chain. It somewhat maps onto your chain of, of, of value that you've got there. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we had uh, search, and we, we began to find things through, through the, the, the machine. And now we're, we're, we're moving uh, further and further up that. So it's not that the old, old stuff went away, it's just the old stuff kind of got um, um, uh, uh, made easier, made cheaper, um, uh, and the, the, what, uh, what, what companies like yours who need to keep doing is, is figuring out how to, how to provide more and more of the, the, the up-the-chain uh, analytics to keep, keep um, 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 people wanting to buy your stuff, so, <laughs> I mean, which I, I like because they're buying our stuff too. Um, so uh, uh, I, I don't think that the old has gone away, but I think the old has, is, is increasingly taken for granted. 
and that where, where, where what we see is, again, these, these applications of more developed uh, machine learning and algorithms that, that get you further and further up there. So that, again, uh, your expertise as a tax lawyer, you could say, hey, I, I know this one's going to pass. I know this one isn't going to pass. And you were, you know, might have been, been pretty good at that. Uh, what we are able to do is, 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 is let the machine emulate that. Uh, we're probably not quite as good as, as, as the best experts in the field, but we are certainly better than, than a, an entry level person. And we can also then provide that sort of, sort of um, uh, think about this one, um, uh, even to the experts, in a way that, that I think is going to be very useful. Very nice, yeah. So, Russell, we, we talked the other day um, in, in tax as an example, in the sense that the paradigm to me has shifted a little bit, is that if I have to search, I've kind of already lost, right? It's, it's, it's really about that information and using technology to make that um, accessible right at your fingertips. Is it, uh, does that track with you, or what are your thoughts around that? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'd say that, um, I mean, I come from the practice side of it, and I work very closely with um, practicing tax lawyers, and uh, largely what they do isn't necessarily related to like filing tax forms. They're actually working at a higher level in transactional work, um, determining how they're gonna structure a particular deal for the most e tax efficient kind of situation. Um, and they're looking more for the, um, t for analysis and secondary uh, material. So less on the primary and um, the primary level, which is kind of where I come in, I might help them for example, pull a preamble to a regulation, which is that if a regulation is proposed as a preamble that indicates from the IRS perspective what they intend the regulation to do, and commentary related to that preamble uh, might come in the form of uh, public commentary, that is, things written by the public. Um, sometimes, I'm, like, uh, for example, the New York State Bar Association tax section writes articles uh, in depth on regulations that are coming out, um, and they want to look at those things. They want to look uh, for themselves. So the practice side of it, the, the determinative factor has more to do with their own analysis, and quite frankly, they don't trust anyone else's. Um, but they want to read everything and what people have said about it, including the IRS, if they can get that. Right, right. So, and, and so for when you're working through that, what are the challenges that you see um, uh, in terms of collecting that information for those attorneys? Yeah, the challenges today are that uh, even just for tax, and this is my specific interest and focus, there's at least five major platforms of which Cheetah is one of them. Right. So determining where to look, where you know how to find what I'm looking for, there's really no area of the law um, besides tax that has more uh, practical secondary editorial like treatises then in fact, it has probably more than almost any other area of laws to put together. So there's lots out there, lots of experts saying things. They want to read all of those, and they don't want to miss anything. And if they miss something, that might be the difference between losing something for a client and um, gaining um, leverage over a deal. Right, right. That's great. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, Oliver, you're have a very deep background from an analytics standpoint. We've obviously worked together in terms of building the, uh, the legislative uh, uh, analytics. Um, what do um, people not understand about analytics that they should understand? Oh, that's a, that's a good and, and broad question. The first step in understanding analytics is that these machine learning algorithms to a large degree, um, um, most of the models, require training. And uh, the, 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 what they are is very, very developed pattern recognizing and con constructing um, um, uh, machines, um, which actually is sort of what humans are to a large degree, too. We, 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 we learn our, our patterns, and, and, and then we, we apply them, and we, we, we make the rules. So these are trying to, to some degree, emulate the, that process. But what you have to realize is that, that you get that your, your analytics are going to be as good as the training set that they had to work with. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons we, we focused in on, on legislation is that there's a lot of data there and the outcomes are pretty clear. It passes, it doesn't pass. Uh, you've got a, a set of a fairly bright line um, of stuff uh, that comes into that. And so uh, if, you, if you turn loose the machine on things, it will, it will learn um, um, uh, about the patterns within, within the data, within the text, and then it will compare those patterns to the outcomes you want it to, to, to do. And if you've got good training data, it's, it's, it's terrific. If you've got bad training data, you're going to get stuff that's less terrific. Uh, uh, it's the traditional garbage in, garbage out. Garbage right? in, exactly, yeah. exactly. And one, one of the wrinkles on this, and not so much in, in the, what we're talking about today, but the, the use of AI in some of these um, uh, sentencing um, uh, algorithms that, that have been uh, uh, very controversial and, and to some degree with, 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 with justification. Because what it turns out is that if you train it against humans, 
all the prejudices that humans bring, you just recapitulate in your training. Uh, so you have to be very careful and understanding about what it is you're, you're, you're putting on, on the table to train these AIs. If you do that, uh, uh, you can then get pretty good results. I mean, uh, this is a room largely of librarians, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to scare you a little bit by saying that if I could put an AI behind you as, as, as you gave reference advice, and if I could get the questions sorted and the data reasonably set and then your outcomes, I could perhaps have a, a, a decent librarian algorithm that would, would, be, would, be, would be there. I know that. I don't mean to, uh, uh, to, to scare you terribly, but if you, had, if, you, if you had that first year student at the desk rather than one of you who's been trained, and you trained with the first year student, you're going to get far less good um, uh, end results uh, from, th from that kind of a context. So again, uh, uh, a key element in understanding all of this is, is that the, 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 how you set the thing up, how you train it, the questions you ask it, and all of those things are key to whether or not the, 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 the algorithm is going to give you useful uh, work or whether it's just going to be, be pretty. Um, so that, that's it. Yeah, that's and that's, that's, it can be extremely time consuming, right? It's not a situation where you did that training, it's much like training um, a new associate or something like that. You're not just flipping the switch, right? It right. takes a long time to get to that. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I, you know, in, in our in our company, we 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 you know, it's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars per vertical, just because you know that's what it, what it, what it takes. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the things that um, uh, to that end that we see that drives success in that, um, and I think this is true in most technology solutions, is when we go to what we would call a narrow use case, which is to say that I and, and Oliver did a good job of explaining in the sense that you look at legislation, there's a defined outcome. It passes or it doesn't pass. It's pretty simple uh, from that standpoint. Um, you have a lot more success in applying technology when I have a defined outcome and a, and a limited scope. The, the, one of the problems that you have with the, uh, the robot lawyer or the robot librarian, as the case goes through, is that what you do from a reference desk is so broad that it's very hard to just uh, to t train Watson, for instance, to come do all that types of stuff. Um, for so, you. So, so you're all safe for a while, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, and just on the, there was a, I think there was a point at Codex that uh, that I remember where on on the danger of institutionalization of bias, um, where a company had uh, developed a resume screening algorithm that they trained from the HR director to go through and screen uh, resumes. And it did a fantastic job of screening the resumes. Unfortunately, the HR director was biased, and so they found a significant gender bias in the results of the, uh, uh, the, the um, application of the algorithm. So you have to be very careful um, with when you train things to, to, to look at that type of bias also. Um, that's great, though. Um, <coughs> Russell, one of the things that I think that we, we talked about is that um, when we go down the path um, in three to five years um, in relationship with our corporate clients, um, between the firm and the corporate clients, um, I think we're starting to see deeper um, uh, relationships or a demand for deeper relationships from the, uh, the, the corporate legal department with the law firm. Um, do you agree with that? Are you seeing that in terms of when you're supporting your attorneys that there's that desire for that? And, and how does the, uh, um, uh, the work that you're doing kind of influence that relationship with the outside uh, client? Well, I'd say that's certainly the case. I mean, I mean, you want to retain your clients, and the more you can create a relationship in which part of what you do facilitates their work, but also that you control maybe in this case and in the future the, the, the documents, the the legal um, connections and like regulatory matters, um, you become more um, useful to the client, but also more important to them. And um, so accessing and holding and correctly um, identifying documents that you actually have control over and making sure those are correctly uh, handled so that there is no bleeding or no access outside besides mm -hmm. clients is, is increasingly a more important kind of question that law firms um, tr uh, tackle. C certainly in terms of the, the, the management of the artifacts themselves, the work. I think the, the uh, other question I, I would have with that is that um, to what extent, or how, I guess to, to rephrase it, um, how does uh, the research that you're doing uh, impact that in, in terms of, do you feel like there is a need to uh, help keep the client informed as well as your, uh, as your, uh, your attorneys in your firm? And, and does your research lend itself to that? It does to some degree, but I mean, we, we, we work through the attorneys predominantly. We don't work directly mm -hmm. often with the clients, but at times we do get client questions and we'll help them as much as we can. Um, so that uh, is certainly a possible question. I mean, the thing is, I think the, it, 10 years ago, I, 
people would have pointed to the library and would have said, especially on a special library situation, they'd have said maybe the libraries are less and less important. And in fact, uh, many law firms and companies have begun to farm out some of that work. Um, the problem with that is that the closeness that you have to the deal and the client, the corporation, to um, the, the actual case in, you know, like the transaction, for example, if it's a spinoff or it's a merger, the more that the researchers can help you, the more you can tell them, the more they know what you do, how you handle deals, what you expect, the more you can actually facilitate and um, in a way add value to what they do. If you farm out the work and you expect someone to write a report or to help you with a transaction that they know nothing about, in fact, you can't tell them about it, the, the really the less helpful you're gonna be to them. So we found actually, uh, I would say now that I, the researchers and the library are much more important and probably as an integrated fashion into law firms, increasingly uh, more and more important. Yeah, right over. Uh, may I add, uh, uh, the, the other piece I, I see from my perspective is that the law librarian community is out ahead of the lawyers on most of these issues. That, that, that the, the, the lawyers, uh, for better or for worse, uh, have been trained by people who don't understand the, the technology very well uh, and, and have traditions of not understanding the technology very well and, and are relatively set in their ways for the most part. The librarian community is, 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 by contrast, has been the locus where, where these new developments have been digested. And, and so, in effect, um, the, the, the librarians in many, many contexts are the, are the, are the, are the cutting edge in, in this. And, and perhaps you're, you're, in fact, waving at your lawyers and going, you should, you should, and they're, they're not necessarily following along. So, so, so the librarian community is, is, is not just important to be in-house, but it would be also important as because it is the place where the firm can actually um, uh, find catalysts for, for, for improvement in, in the technological realm. May I take one, one, yeah, one other? Yeah. As I'm going to push back slightly on my, 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 my colleague here from, from um, uh, Paul Weiss, um, um, uh, because I think that your firm is not necessarily representative broadly. Um, in fact, uh, having, having negotiated against Paul Weiss in, back in the day, I know that it's not represented broadly. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and I, I started out in Wall Street myself in a different firm. Uh, the, there is this kind of, you know, as you said, they will not trust anything else. They will take the time to look at every document themselves and, and come to their own conclusion because that is how you do law. Except for the fact where uh, lots and lots of places that isn't quite how you do law anymore. Uh, that, that, that clients are pushing back on, on that kind of unlimited expenditure uh, model. Um, um, uh, many, many firms are, are, are finding that, in fact, the, this kind of AI sorting piece is, is, is a very useful initial piece. Yeah, you want to, you know, the human eye is the last eye on it, but, 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 but getting there can't be that, that model for many, many firms um, any, anymore, uh, that you just have to be able to take, take uh, some of these, these AI-assisted, um, 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 I won't use the word shortcuts, but, but, but different, different pathways to that knowledge and, 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 and accept that as, as what, you're, what you're able to do for people given the money and the time that, that, that they're, that's willing to be committed. So in some ways, that AI step, um, uh, uh, your, your, your firm may be one of, the, one of the, the, the last holdouts against some of the things which many, many other places are going to need to undertake. Yeah. Russell, do you agree with that? Uh, um, well, I, I think that there's a whole level of difference between different firms, like in, let's just say in New York itself, and that, um, you know, if you, have a, if you have a large acquisition or a merger or a spinoff that's literally billions of dollars now, if you make a mistake, I mean, so if you want to go for someone who's going to rely upon um, less, you know, analysis perhaps or less, um, you know, farming through all the minutia and making sure they don't miss something, then that's fine and that might be okay most of the time. But if you make a mistake, um, the consequences are quite large. And um, the attorneys where I work, the partners in particular, I mean, they're paid an enormous amount of money. In fact, sort of a shocking amount. But I would, <laughs> but I would say that in the end, um, you know, if you're doing a deal and, you, and doing it wrong may cost hundreds of millions of dollars, you want the best person in the room and to make sure that they talk to everyone else. And I'd say that when, at least when tax people get together, they do it in a form a little bit more Socratically. They say what they think, they, they, they say what they know, and then what they've heard. And they want to know from the other people what they think, including associates and partners, and from other firms. So and so has said this. And it's this practical level of the way law gets done, especially in the area of tax, which is so much more nuanced. You're always negotiating um, how far you can push the limit. And you want to make sure that you have enough on your side that if you have to go face to face with 
an agent on the other side, like the IRS, you could tell them how you got there and where you came from. So it's, it's nuance, the, the expectations are quite large. Sure, absolutely. And, 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 and to your point, I think you made the point, in the, uh, you kind of were violently in agreement in the sense that um, if I have a billion dollar transaction, I'm hiring a, a limited number of law firms. Right at that That's point in time, and, true. I, and yeah. I am spending yeah. a lot of money, and I know that I'm going to spend a lot of money. Yeah. If I'm doing a $10 million M&A transaction, that's, that's a very different kind of situation. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, certainly. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I, you, you bring an interesting point up, Russell, in the sense that um, you are a specialized um, research analyst in a deep niche vertical area. Um, not every firm can afford to hire um, a specialized tax uh, analyst or researcher. Um, what rec uh, recommendations do you have to firms in terms of if they don't have that specialized knowledge to the same degree or the ability to put those resources in, how should they approach the, the, the research problem? How does technology help them with that? I think, I think in, in the future, the way technology can help them is to pulling all of the material together. It's, what's interesting about tax, of course, is that it has a regulatory and statutory um, focus on Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, and the regulations therein. So, the, you know, the model that, um, you know, that Cheetah has right now for uh, redlining regulations or statutes is absolutely wonderful. But once you start connecting the changes in that law to the material b related directly below it, like sec uh, Senate and conference reports and House reports, and the, and the wealth of, of really wonderful secondary material, for example, Texas Magazine uh, goes back to the 1940s. And um, I, there's some great, they, they're often some of the most important uh, commentary about proposed regulations um, appeared in Texas Magazine long before a lot of um, internet-related electronic information was available. So, I mean, I, I pulled articles from 1942 before because they wanted to know what were they thinking when they wrote these regulations. So, you know, the article told a, a commentary about what they thought, what they actually said, what was the IRS saying at the time. All this stuff is actually vastly important to um, people looking at regulations and trying to determine what were the IRS thinking, what were they doing. And if you go before the mid-1970s, there's very little information there. So I'd say pull from the secondary strengths that, that places like um, um, Walter Sklur has and try to make those connections, maybe deep mine, deep mine uh, mining for data related to code sections, regulations, revenue rulings, private letter rulings, and you pull those all together you know, they're like links to the statutes and the regulations. Right. It's kind of what's relevant to the yeah. matter at so hand. So I could just pull one thing up yeah. and it all pulls it together. You know, like, it's all connected. If you can make those connections for us, that's really, really useful, I think. Well, fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, and then we'll get uh, we'll open up for some questions. But uh, Oliver, if you could put your progno prognostication hat on and talk to us about research, content, um, and the next three to five years, what do you think is going to be the biggest change that you see occur? Well, I, I think you're going to see increasingly powerful um, um, uh, analytic uh, tools and, and sorting tools. Again, as if I go back to that, you know, uh, the initial search, uh, the sorting, the prioritizing, and then the analytics, that we're really moving up that chain. If, if you uh, look at your own products or walk around the halls uh, down below and look at other, some other folks, I mean, for instance, you've got the, 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 the work with the, with the contract analytics, which I, I, I know uh, you, you, you've been working on. Uh, that is moving up that chain. And, and, and what you see then, if you're in a law firm kind of context, is the thing that the less expert people used to do is more and more going to be able to be done uh, competently by the by the, the analytics. So you, 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 I, I, when I was a junior associate, I was turned loose on a stack of stuff and was you know asked to pull all kinds of info out of it. And this was back in the in the old days when when human brains did that. Um, um, you know, it was expensive, it was time consuming, it was boring as all get out. Um, and uh, now that you could set up a machine to do most of that kind of thing for you. The pinnacle expert, the expert at the top, is still going to be, be be pretty safe in terms of, of of having the role. We're not replacing that person yet. <laughs> But we're getting closer and closer. So, so again, uh, uh, if you can imagine, if you can imagine a, a, a task in that stack of, of finding, sorting, analyzing, uh, in the law, that task has some, at least one or two companies trying to, to, to automate it, and uh, and you're going to see, uh, you know, patchy success going up, but more and more success, and then companies like yours incorporating more and more, and 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 the platform getting getting. Uh, 
I'm more and more confident across all these these boundaries. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with uh, Richard Susskind and the concept that there's going to be an, a rise in the uh, concept of a paraprofessional, uh, uh, much like a nurse practitioner you see in the medical uh, uh, field, where it's not necessarily the same uh, accreditation as you see with current attorneys? What's What's been interesting on that one is to see that the experiments so far have failed. Um, uh, I think it's Washington State that put that in in, um, in place explicitly, failed. Uh, what we're seeing at, 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 at Vermont and, and other law schools actually is, 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 is uh, an interesting, uh, um, the master's program for with the non-JD master's, which is kind of a step up on that right, professional, right. where if you're in, working in the EPA, for instance, um, um, and you need to know more law, but you don't have to know how to do divorces, you know, just in a, you know, or, or, or try a criminal, criminal case. So, so the general JD isn't, isn't an appropriate, but you, you have these, these sliced in masters, and that, that you're gonna see a, a big increase in. Interesting. Russell, if you put your prognostication hat on and you go out five years or so, and particularly you have the lens of, of working at a, a prestigious large firm, w how do you see uh, the uh, the research world changing um, from a tool standpoint or, or the day-to-day -day work that you do? Do you see that changing, or uh, where do you think that's going? Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to change uh, rapidly. Uh, and I think that uh, th one of the things that Oliver pointed out, which is really true, it, it, on the on the document level, I mean, a lot of the things that attorneys used to do, which is to go through boxes and boxes of documents and comparing them and, and you know, looking through, doing their due diligence, on a particular, let's say it's, a, it's an acquisition or maybe it's a, just a litigation case, those things are being turned over to, I mean, not just paralegals, but um, ma probably machine learning or some way of, of, of analyzing the material that you get through and finding the clauses or particular phrases they're looking for. Th th that's actually been very, very useful. I think that will certainly continue on. And I, I think maybe, you know, the problem is what we've seen over the last 10 years is, a, is that the fracture of, of information is going from different platforms and different platforms and different products are getting bought by other, you know, so it's, you, you see it d being more desperate. And I think that maybe what um, uh, technology can do for us is to make it easier so we can find the things, we don't have to worry about where it is. We just know what we're looking for, we'll know when we find it, but we don't need to necessarily go to every platform or every publisher. We may just have one little place where we just start typing in, like I'm mm -hmm. looking for, it's m a it's Gensberg. Oh, it's on Cheetah. Okay, then I'm, I'm looking for Garlock, de de you know, Dead Instruments. Oh, that's on, you know, and it'll just start pulling up information that I'm looking for and give me what I want right now. So, well, there's a product for you if you want to take it on, I would, I, I, which is, is I, I like when you go online to, to buy an airplane ticket now, you know, you, you go on, on Priceline and then, it, you know, it says, and here are seven other sites you could look at. So I don't know whether 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 that would be something that you're, <laughs> but 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 it, exactly what you're describing would be would be a a, a a a platform on top of all these other things. Interesting, good business. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. We have um, Walter Score. We have uh, health business as well as a legal and tax business in the health. Um, research world, you see a lot more of that aggregation and, and the value starts to come into being able to do the deep analytical research on a platform and who owns the particular content is less important. It's kind of an ag uh, more aggregation across that to hit exactly what you're talking about, Russell. That would require us to get along and collaborate in a way that we probably don't do right now with our, our competitors. But, um, but who knows? Um, and, and, and if I may take yeah, one, yeah, one yeah. last thing, which is, is Never say what I do can't be automated. I, uh, people say that, oh, you know, I, I watch that, you know, the doctors are getting automated, the, the diagnostics of uh, doctors, we could automate that. Lawyers, now we need to talk to our clients or, or, or librarians, we need to talk to our lawyers, whatever it is. Uh, uh, that doesn't say that everything will be immediately, but, but, but what I have seen is that over and over again, you say, no, that couldn't possibly be automated because my expertise is necessary. And that is the, the, the precursor to, 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 to it happening. So, so uh, uh, my, 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 my suggestion suggestion to folks in this room is, 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 is embrace that rather than reject it and then say, okay, but that, uh, there's still going to be need for me to understand how that's been done and, and explore and explain and all of that. So, so, so if, you, if you go forward, um, 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 my rule of thumb is, is that everything is at least possibly automatable. Uh, and many things will turn out not to be, but many other things will be. So, 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 so uh, keep your mind open as you go forward and, and then be that translator of that process rather than, than, than a casualty of it if it goes forward. Yeah, and I think this, is, this community is ideal 
Yeah, to yeah, be yeah doing again, that, the right. librarians have been, typically been 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 within the, the legal practice world and the, and and within the academia, the front end of all of that uh, um, uh, understanding. That's right. So I I, th I think that's a good um, point to to pause on here and open up for questions to the uh, the group as a whole. Uh, well, questions, anybody? Yes, sir. Everybody else, I'm married to one, so. <laughs> so I'm, but have you found in your experience also that tax attorneys, at least I've found, tax attorneys still use more traditional means? They use a lot more print in addition to the online as compared to any of the other departments. Have you found that to be true or not so much anymore? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I still have a library, um, which has shrunk down quite a bit, but it all has major treatises and. I, I'm for, exa for example, um, there is something called the Bloomberg BNA um, portfolios, tax portfolios, and um, Bloomberg has tried to get rid of just about everything, including upcoming the Daily Tax Report, which has been in paper forever, is now going to disappear. Um, but uh, they've gotten so much pushback on the portfolios, which are these small little individual uh, authored, um, almost like mini treatises, and they have about, I don't know, about a thousand of them, and airy little niches of tax. So um, yeah, they insist upon the paper. In fact, just recently I ordered another set of those portfolios because one was out and a partner wanted to look at it. Very easy to steal. Yeah, they wanted to sit down and make sure they, in fact, they could print it off, I mean, on, from Bloomberg, but they don't, they didn't want that. They wanted the paper. We still, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing is that uh, uh, we would have thought that uh, um, print was dead, and we had a con we were at uh, an Evolve the Law event last night, and a librarian said uh, when she went through library school uh, a good while ago, everybody said, "Oh, you're crazy to be coming in here because the books are going to go away." And yeah. we still have a lot of print business; it's remarkable. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that a, a couple of senior level partners, in fact, they're sort of heads of the department, they saw the, the library disappearing, and it was the young attorneys who are the most. Uh, sophisticated for uh, searching and doing everything online, they were the, mo the ones that really insisted we keep the books. That's interesting. Questions? Yeah. So the gentleman over there. Hi, my name is uh, Sadie's SPD. I'm from Wild Gotchel, and I'm also the tax person. I want to just second what Russell said. Um, I do the orientations for the tax department. And the younger attorneys, I would expect them to be you know, ahead of the curve wanting to do things digitally, but they always come back saying, I want the print version of this, I want the print version of that. And I, I try to emphasize that it's, it may be easier for them to search things electronically, but they are still, they still love books, just like I do. And um, so I just wanted to second what Russell was saying about uh, print being still preferred, even though it's going away for other areas, but in tax specifically, they, um, they still use the books. And Walter's Clure. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Questions from the crowd? Okay, well, I have st we still have a little time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a questioner here and, and throughout here. So um, one of the topics that we see come through, I would say, on a regular basis, um, at PLL and other places is, is the concept of innovation. And, and it's, it's quite a buzzword, still remains as such. Um, what, you know, what is the role, Russell, in your opinion, of um, the, the library in terms of driving innovation um, in the firm? Uh, well, I think that, especially now uh, with all, like you said, buzzwords like AI, uh, you really have to, be in, you have to be completely knowledgeable. You have to know what's happening, what's out there, what's gonna be happening. What works and what doesn't work? I think there's, there's so many um, things that people are hearing, it sounds phenomenal, like they can, they, you can do this or you can do that, or do we have AI and how are we at using, utilizing it? And which, which products in fact do or really have true AI and what's just like machine learning or and what's the difference? So I think that the library is really in, at the point where they need, to, they need to be the most informed person in the, in the, uh, the room because people will ask and you have to have an answer. Yeah. Oliver, to kind of as a follow-on to that, um, what should the firm not be doing and what should they be doing in terms of innovation in your opinion? I, I think that the firms, first of all, need to be innovating around their, their, their business model, which the, many, many are. Uh, the, the, the clients uh, often push back on, on, on cost, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you who are involved are, 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 are well aware of all of that. But pushing, then moving from that is then, I think, inter innovating really in the, in the workflow model. You had pointed out uh, here on your slide that there's that classic kind of, kind of workflow. And, and 
uh, uh, lawyers are, are, aren't necessarily the best people to do this because at least my experience of lawyers is that the, the, the particularly the more uh, cerebral they were, the less good they were at actually managing anybody. Um, and, and, and figuring out how to, how to actually do, do, do project management, process management, all those things. Again, that is penetrating the, the, the firms, but, but, but that is a key piece of, of innovation. Is, and, and, and technology is not the only element in that by a long shot, but it is an important element in that, whether it's, it's a, a, a case management um, a software package that allows you to do all the things, that, that the cool things that you can do with that, or, or, or the, the analytics. Again, uh, but then figuring out a, a model of practice that is going to be a bit different uh, than, than certainly the old-fashioned one. And I, I know that's going on, but it, that, 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 that's, that's a big piece of where I think the innovation is going to be in the practice world. Interesting, interesting. Um, the uh, last question I have, Russell, uh, is when you are looking at the adoption of a tool or something like that in the, uh, in the firm, so you've got something that you've found that uh, gives you an efficiency boost, gives you a better outcome or something like that, um, what's the advice that you could give to the community here in terms of how to pitch that inside your organization to try and get them to spend the money on it or to get attorneys to start to interact with it? W w what is your advice on that? Um, I mean, well, one of the things I do is I show the really the uh, senior level people, especially in this case, partners who I know who are the most interested in, uh, let's say, research, and I'll show them what's new and what, what could be useful for it, because usually it's top-down. I mean, if the partners think, or the more senior-level associates are using it, um, the more likely that they're gonna, you know, they're gonna use it more. And then I show it to them, you know, I walk by, and it's a small group, so I'll just stop in their offices, and I'll not only inform them by email, I'll actually walk in and say, hey, you want to? You, can I show you this this to you? Or next time there's a question that relates to something that is a tool that I can use. For example, the um, statutory changes. For example, I showed a number of people. They thought that was really cool. Whether they'll use it or how they'll use it um, is still left up to them. But I, st I then I hear them telling others about it, and that's the way it works. Uh, and ta on the tax level, people are pretty good researchers. And they want to know what's what's out there. In fact, they, they stumble upon things I've not even seen myself. So often they'll be telling me about something. So uh, I think um, uh, let's close out. Just a parting shot from each of you, if I could. Uh, thought uh, that you want to leave the crowd with here, Oliver? Uh, I will uh, tell the really bad joke, the grizzly bear joke. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, the grizzly bear joke is that joke where, where two two friends are out walking and and uh, grizzly bear jumps out on the path and 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 the, one of them starts to change his or her shoes to sneakers and the friend says you can't outrun a grizzly bear and they say I don't have to outrun a grizzly bear I just have to outrun you, <laughs> and and the world of legal technology is to some degree that world because because um, uh, the, the the grizzly bear is there you know this technology is is there uh, companies uh, like Walters Kluwer and others are, are are developing it as hard and fast as they know how uh, uh, it will be one of the things that your your firm your 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 law school whatever it is you're working at will need to deal with. And we'll need actually to be on the on the on the front end of. And so the, the, my 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 suggestion is, you know, put on your sneakers. You don't have to outrun um, uh, the te technology. You're not you're not going to you're not going to stop it. But what you can do is 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 keep your firm, keep your school, whatever it is, ahead of the of the curve a bit. And that that will be 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 the way to to survive the the, the disruptions and changes that are coming. Excellent. And Russell, you get the last word. Yeah, I, I think that. Um, the librarians and researchers like myself are kind of in the trenches with the, the real questions people have. And the facility between us and the online systems uh, are probably pretty important. And certainly, we know better than almost anyone what changes need to have to happen, what, what things we can recommend. And I, I, like, I, I reached out uh, when they were first developing Cheetah, and they showed me the, um, the statutory changes module. and. Um, I had questions, and I had, you know, I, I brought up ideas that they could probably utilize. I mentioned a few of them here, and I think the more that we actually can can not just let the publishers run with it, but we can actually help them and help ourselves, the better we're going to help um, the people that we're providing uh, help from, like in libraries, and in our, you know, firms or our companies. Um, so we're kind of there to both model what needs to happen, but also, you know, t um, reach out and make those changes, and in house. Um, be the leaders of, of what's actually going to happen because if you don't, 
I mean, as Oliver said, that bear was going to run you, or, and you're going to be eaten up. But um, you know, it's, <laughs> let's let's not have that happen. <laughs> so, and, and and the one note I'll have also just to follow on from Russell uh, is that. Um, those of us who create solutions um, should be talking to you and should be getting feedback from you, and that should be going into the building of a solution. If I ever walk away for three years, do something, and then unveil it, and we haven't talked to any customers, I know what's going to happen. It's not going to be successful, right? Um, because I'm, I'm not that smart, and uh, it requires actually working with end users. So. If your vendor doesn't want to talk to you, then find a different vendor. But most likely, if you talk to them about what you need from a solution, they're going to be very happy about that. So don't feel shy about picking up the phone and saying, gosh, you guys should be doing this. Um, we may not always say, yeah, we're going to do that. It could be cost prohibitive, for instance. But, uh, um, but the, the input is something that definitely drives what we do every day. So I think that that's something that you do have control over. Um, and you might find that all of a sudden, because you're the squeaky wheel, things start happening that you really would like to have happen for you. So that's a good thing. Um, before we go, uh, you should have these cards here. Um, if you fill out the card on the back um, as we finish up here, uh, we will email you, I believe, a uh, gift card for a, a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I think it's a $10 gift card at Starbucks, which probably buys at least two lattes. So, um, uh, and thank you all very much. Appreciate your time here. Thank you. Thank you.